Hey everyone, welcome back to Make It Happen Mondays, where we talk about sales, business, entrepreneurship, personal growth, mental health, and everything in between with guests who I truly respect and I think make a positive impact on the world around us. And today's guest is Jason Inouye. Now, Jason works for a company called Ari, A-R-R-I, and they do super high-end video production stuff and cameras, like hardware stuff. So he's not my typical ICP, ideal customer profile, that I personally go after, but he is the exact person that I love working with as part of the new membership that I'm bringing to the table these days. And again, for those of you who don't know, just go to jbarrows.com and you can sign up for the membership where you get my live training and coaching from me, AMAs and everything else. And Jason took that and ran with it. And Jason was literally at every single session I've done, every AMA being actively involved. And he went from being somebody who just sold into the movie industry and was doing his thing just like everybody else to all of a sudden cracking into huge accounts like LinkedIn and a bunch of others to sell massive amounts and really just change the trajectory of his entire business and the leadership in there about where they need to focus their time. And he did it by engaging with all this content and really, really leveraging it. So I brought him on the podcast to share a little bit of his story and obviously do a little bit of self-promotion here with the platform for all the right reasons. So if you're thinking about it, it's $365 for the whole year gives you all access. And if you're somebody like Jason, you can get a thousand times your value out of it if you dive into it. So take a listen to this one and let's make it happen. Jason Anoy, how's it going, my friend? How you been? Great. Thanks for having me, John. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. You, I'm, I'm really happy to have you on this for, for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, to give the audience a little bit of context here, um we've been working together for how long now like how long have you been kind of part of the membership i feel like at least three years right? i've been following you for quite a while listening to your podcast as well absolutely yeah. so and and you're one who i think has out of anybody i know um and i work with has taken the most advantage of the the resources and the content and also just the open you know i always it's funny i always tell people like hey here's my cell phone Here's my email address, you know, use it, please. Right. And like 99% of people don't, I don't know whether they think, oh, well, I don't want to bother him or whatever, but you're one of those 1% of the people to do. And your journey has been, uh, inspiring for me because, you know, we talk about this, like I, I live in the SaaS world for the most part. Right. And, you know, training SaaS, and I always look at it and, you know, kind of freak out that my stuff is like, I got to keep evolving and doing this. But it's funny, once I take one step out of SaaS, it's like sales 1985 all over again. And and so a lot of the stuff that is that people think is not relevant is totally relevant because it's it's across the board. It's about sales skills. So could you give the audience a little bit of your background about because I want to get into what you're selling, how you're selling, and then how you made a little bit of the shift to to break out of the mold, if you will. But if you could give us some background on on where you're coming from, Jason, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I that's such a when you look at my LinkedIn profile, it kind of looks like what do you want to be when you grow up someday? You know, it looks like kind <laughs> yep. of all over the map because I came from the film industry, the film background. But, uh, you know, what What really I learned was all my process of creating content and filmmaking that I really liked closing deals. Um, okay. And I actually kind of would prefer someone else produce the content. Yep. Um, I had a boutique company. Um, we did a lot of TV shows, uh, supported a lot of shows like Sons of Anarchy, uh, Mayans, and all kinds of these posters behind me. But uh, yep. but like. what I found was is I really liked trying to get the work. Like I enjoyed talking to Fox, and Universal, Lionsgate, and trying to get them to use our services. Yep. And I, I just found that was something that was, I was more passionate about. And then I took a step out of the movie business and learned traditional sales. I, I did the Xerox copier sale and I took the <laughs> Xerox training too as yeah. well. Um, I did work for Motorola Channel Partner and uh, I did I did just a small uh, SaaS learning as well. But I, I feel like, you know, I wanted to come home. Like I, I feel like the uh, Kool-Aid is, you know, what I loved was, you know, coming back home, which was the movie business, TV yeah. and broadcast. And working with product that I fell in love with and stuff. So, and that's it. what brought me back. But you know, it was very like it was kind of funny going just a a little bit into SaaS, but coming back where it was still like you mentioned, 
you know, moving away from like steak dinners and golf matches to working in the digital space. And, and, uh, I learned so much. And I remember showing up to your, you were at this, uh, nutshell ensemble of speakers at a CRM nutshell com- uh, online virtual conference. And what inspired me is when you said, you know, just take 1% at a time, get better every day. So then I really took that to heart and I was really trying to, um, you know, make myself better in sales. Um, and, and this whole, like taking people out for dinner and stuff like uh, that, that doesn't work, you know, because yeah. it, it was a big generational shift in the filmmaking world too, as well. You know, the, um, you know, the millennials and the, even the Gen Z are coming up and remind kids next door, or no more about cinema verite than I would ever in sixth grade, fourth grade. (laughs) So like, like I had to learn how to speak to, you know, uh, a new audience that was up and coming. And by the way, they don't play golf and they don't eat steak dinner. So that's, that's made me really learn. And I feel I took away a lot from what you were sharing and, and how the outreach and the outbound uh, needed to be. So I I love it. That's how I got to where I am. So. And, and just for a little bit more context, so what you actually sell now is super high end video, like hard, like not, you don't sell software as a service. You don't sell, you, there is a service to this, but the main thing is, is hardware, like really high end cameras that are like for the yeah. top of the top when it comes to production, right? Yeah. So our products are used anything from Star Wars to Avengers to Marvelous Mrs. Maisel's yeah. to using the Game of Thrones. It seems on so many of that. So I really enjoyed our conversation because we, you know, I, I, you know, always learn about finding the gap, finding the pain point. But when you and I talked, it's also about vision too, right? Because oh, yeah. it was like, you have a Porsche, but we've been sometimes branded as the Lamborghini of cameras. But, yep. you know, it's like, well, if you have Porsche, is that stick shift really that bad to jump that high? So it's like right. more having a conversation where you want to get to then like not always a problem or pain. Yeah. There are those too, but there's also another aspect that a lot of our uh, clients were dealing with too. So yeah, absolutely. That, <laughs> and that vision is getting that, getting out of that feature function, right? Cause in, cause in your world, I got to imagine that oh, you yeah. know, once you get into that feature function space, it's just, it's like a race to the bottom, right? It's like, okay, you know, we're slightly yeah. better, but then it's a pricing thing. It's like, okay, well, you got some cool extra features here, but are they worth 50% more than this other camera that I got? Right. That's pretty much the name it, of the game or in the traditional it, sense, right? Exactly. And then, you know, we, we, we love in the movie business to talk tech and stuff yeah. too, and, and yeah. try to resist and hold back and, you know, really being a better listener too is what I learned from you. Absolutely. Cause it was you know, your urge to just kind of show up and throw up like you share is like, but don't laugh. say it, don't say it, listen, listen and stuff like that better. It, it's been very important and stuff in the learning and, in the space. And you've taken it because, you know, and again, traditionally you would go to movie studios, you go to the Fox, you go to the HBOs and that type of thing. But what made you, go and start thinking about corporate like because we'll, we'll kind of fast forward and you got some really really baller clients in the corporate space but where in your journey did you kind of say you know what i need to expand my ideal customer profile here i need to start looking in other areas and what was that driver for you yeah you know it kind of started um talking with a lot of outside of the box youtube creators um you know, sometimes they actually weren't using our high end equipment yet, but their vision of what they wanted to do and they shared with some of their corporate clients they also do work with too. And how quantity has reached quality and quality has reached quality. Like they all reach like kind of the same level now. So it was like, oh, wow. Okay. So those people want that quality as well uh, for their brands. Uh-huh. And I think that really started me to like investigate more and more to see like huh and and the quantity went up too that was the one thing yep. they're not our products pre you know uh 10 10 50 years ago was very only a rental product and so yep. um but the quantity of content because of creators and brands need to shoot every day and film content and photography that didn't make sense anymore 
and stuff. Oh, yeah. And um, a lot of people start building studios. That was the other big thing. I never heard of brands building studios before. <laughs> that was yeah. a very new insight for us. You said, I mean, you had told me that was it was a Google or Apple who's building like 30 or 50 studios or something like that. Well, like, give me some numbers as far as these, because these corporations are now, they're no longer outsourcing their, their production. They're, they're insourcing it quite a bit, right? Yeah. A lot of them have internal production teams, you know, some even have up to 26 separate production teams too, and yeah. they're building separate studios. And, um, I think what's very an insight to me was that they were, I don't know if that's a, Silicon Valley model, but a lot of siloing. Um, yeah. So I see a lot of teams not working with one another, which was I thought was very interesting. Like, oh, you don't know here to here. Um, yeah. So I, I, I would love a referral of one team, but there was no referral. It's like <laughs> ground zero every, every time starting. Yeah. Uh, because like, oh, I don't, I have no idea who that person is or yep. who would who he recommend. So I, I, I don't know if that's just them, but. Uh, but it gave me great opportunity to meet new people, yeah. and um, it's incredible. Um, but the value they they take it just as serious as a two hundred fifty million dollar feature film, right? Yeah. And the quality and value, and so there's no difference. Um, and they want it, and they need it, and the just keeps going more and more, and doesn't stop. So yeah, and no. and even with these layoffs that's happening, the production teams are still shooting. Are filming, are they? you know, it's like that. Yeah, they understand the value and mean it. <laughs> well, I think it gets back to you know, content is you know, content is king in the sense that the the better content you put out there, the more the more exposure you get, and it's the easy easy way to market. But it's also, I think, you do reach a level of quality that you know you need to attain in order to maintain that reputation, that brand, and everything else. And that's why. You know, a lot of the small startups, they, they might hack their way to it with the iPhone version or whatever it is. But once you get, I, I, I experienced this myself. Like when I first started my, my online portal and all that other stuff, I was like, all right, let me just kind of get something together here to see if it'll even work. And then, because my original plan was I wasn't going to actually charge people for it. I was just going to bundle it into my training to, to kind of increase my, my day rate, if you will. And then it just so happened that people were like, Hey, can I have just that? And I was, and then it, like charging them for it, I was like, oh, if I'm going to charge you for this, I I, I kind of feel like it needs to be nicer. <laughs> you know what I mean? It needs to feel like it's a quality because anybody can pick up their iPhone and don't get me wrong. I think it's content is content. Get it out there, right? So for, for anybody listening right now, if you're like, oh, I, I need a perfect, no, you don't. No, just get started with it. But once you get to a level where you're charging people for it, for memberships and those type of things, that's where I think quality matters. And especially for these big brands, I mean, they're talk to me a little bit, and you don't have to name names here, but how meticulous are they? If they're spending 250, you know what I mean? Like if they're spending yeah, yeah. that much money, how meticulous are they at like the nuances of how their brand is filmed and represented? And, and do you get involved in helping that as, as, as part of the package? Yeah, absolutely. Cause, um, you know, like a product, like a, I use a car as example. They're super hyper critical about their branded red or blue or green or whatever yeah. the colors, and they want it absolute uh -huh. perfect to the nut. And so that's been a big thing. And then there's other colors, like some brands have like funny purplish pink colors that they can never get right there. They have to get it there. The executives nah. get really angry if you didn't hit that color exact and stuff and then um i'm even working with a <laughs> believe it or not a a, a window manufacturing company and they need to shoot from indoors to outdoors outdoors indoors and hold this extreme dynamic range and so these are conversations uh we have and yeah, yeah they're they're hypercritical because they're protecting the brand as well so it can't look you know. yeah <laughs> you talked about the painting the vision what what are, give us some examples of because I think so many people are still stuck in the feature function. You know, you went to Xerox. It kills me right now that I still to this day get people coming to me being like, you know what, John, I you know, and we need some help to transition to more of solution selling. My reps are still like showing up and throwing up and pitching, and I'm, you know, and when they say solution selling, I'm like, you, you do realize that Xerox came out with that back in like the late '70s, right? Like solution selling has been around yeah. for about 50 years at this point. So like, where you been? 
Um, but I, I could easily see in your space how feature function selling is was the way to go, right? Because look at how awesome this product is. And if I really, <laughs> you know, Gong has this nexus of, and I believe in this truly, which it doesn't matter what you sell, it matters how you sell, right? So when you made this, when you started making the switch to 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 away from feature function and towards value, can you give me some examples of, uh, or towards vision, if you will? Can you give me some examples of mm-hmm. how you were to paint that vision for them, and then where it like really resonated with people and it elevated the conversation? Yeah. So we talk a lot about how you want to reach that intangible emotion from what you get from an image. Yeah. And because we want to, and they all seen it, they all feel it, like when you saw that Volkswagen commercial or saw some, so why did you buy it, right? That's mm-hmm. the intangible emotions that you get from an image. So we're talking more on that level and stuff and how colors and light and how all that stuff works. Because a lot of the people, what's slightly different actually, the persona or ICP at the corporate level is, they don't have in-house production people. So you're talking to video producers, you know, production managers, still believe in the creative look, but they're they're responsible for the overall package or the overall end of the content. So we are trying to really share that emotional impact that you get uh, from our tools, but uh, mm-hmm. we don't go into the weeds and stuff like that too, because yeah. that's just a total turn off and... They yeah, go, yeah, that's not my job. I don't do that. Um, but a lot of things like that. The other thing we do is also is they do though, even though it's it's not a feature from they do shoot in crazy locations out <laughs> yeah. in the sea. So reliability is also a big factor yeah. too, because mm-hmm. even though if they go, oh, it's not a two hundred fifty million dollar movie, they're still spending could be spending oh. hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if their product goes down there yeah yeah i can't <laughs> imagine that like, or, yeah. <laughs> well i i experienced that myself just with salesforce for instance like they did this outside the box um uh series and it was and i couldn't believe i was invited to this by the way like it was it was eight people one of them was tony hawk the other one was damon john the other was like the ceo oh, wow. or nice. the CRO of of forbes magazine i was like what the fuck am i doing here right but like so they came to boston and they rented out and this is when i knew like your world was like like real and the amount of money and everything else because me and chris my my partner we were like all right cool we'll go downtown like we'll shoot this and then we'll get out of there we'll grab lunch whatever dude we showed up and i'm not exaggerating there was 50 people for and this was just me yep. like they were then going to go to new york and do the forbes uh CRO. And I'm like, what the fuck? And like, they ha- they had rented out the entire top floor of this hotel overlooking the city of Boston. And it was just for a two minute clip of me. And I'm sitting there like, there's cameras everywhere. There's production everywhere. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, this yep. is, I-, I remember looking at Chris being like, what the fuck is going on? Right? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I think I probably should have taken this a little bit more seriously than I did. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it came out beautiful. Yeah. Like they, they came up, but I, yeah. but I, it really struck me their attention to detail, their concern. I mean, they had a wardrobe for me. Like I brought some stuff that were yeah. my typical clothes, and they were like, "Nope, you have to wear this." And I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> you know." And and this is like yeah. you'll, you'll appreciate this. They were like, "Well, we want you to be authentic. We want you to be authentic." And I'm like, "Okay." I go, you don't, you know what that means as far as I'm concerned, right? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. it, and so I brought my clothes and they kept putting on the, all these other clothes on me. And I'm like, I would never wear this. Like I, I, not in my wildest dreams would I wear this stupid sweater that you just put me in. So if you really want authenticity, you're not going to put me in the stupid sweater because this is not how I dress. Right. right? And the, but right. they were so meticulous with what they were, with their, what they were paying attention to. So how do you deal with that? Like, how do you deal with, cause because I think if I translate that to tech sales in some ways, like there's almost always the end, you know, there's the business buyer, then there's the technical buyer, right? So there's the economic <laughs> buyer that's like, I see the vision and I want this and what, but then there's the technical buyer that has to make sure that the product does what it's supposed to do. And a lot of times that's where you get sucked into the weeds. So, so for your sales process, were there, are those two different types of people that you deal with? Are there, are there the visionaries that are like, Hey, yes. And then there's also the technical people. And how, if so, 
how were how have you been able to bridge the gap between the two? Because a lot of times the technical people will throw a grenade into the solution because it doesn't do this one yeah. stupid little thing. And now you're spinning your wheels. And now the business person says, well, if it doesn't have that, because I don't know, I'm not the technical person, but if they say, so it really screws things up. So how are you able to balance the line between the visionary stuff and the tactical things um, as you kind of navigated some of these larger organizations? Yeah. Good question. It is, it is a challenge. Um, I mean, because yeah, we, uh, we we do have also specialists too. Um, I know it's yeah. called solution engineer, but we call yep. them specialists too, and and they come in and and support us too. And we do make so many different products though. Those that really get technical in the weeds, we do actually have products that we could go into that for them too as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh it's it's a lot of what you taught me john too is you know i'm trying you know to have an omni touch approach i've been wow. trying to not leave any of them out you know i'm hitting the top level bill, but i'm at the same time trying to hit you know the technical people so i'm not just feel yeah. like i'm leaving anyone out and i i i really use your line that you say like hey uh in this conversation you know do you think there'll be anyone left out we move mm -hmm. forwards or something. So that's been a big help too as well. What? They say, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. You're right. I should bring in so-and-so and stuff All like right. that too. And and that's, that's, that's been a big help as well. And so yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it is a challenge though, I would say, cause, um, yeah. you know, cause some are freelance they bring in too. That's the other challenge too. So the, the, there's 13 on staff, but of course the, people that executed the technical people um could be just freelancers so yeah. i have to in my discovery find that out too because yeah. yes they could draw a total grenade at me it's like no i don't like those guys i like this yeah. over here like <laughs> so i have yeah. to really do good discovery to find out you know do you hire a lot of freelancers because in sales nav or so i can't find any technical people right too especially in the corporate space that's a challenge Totally. Yeah, the freelance, that's always that kind of variable. You're like, oh shit, how do I, you know what I mean? Because you're not, now you're just, you're a freelancer. So you only really care about yourself. <laughs> so, and yeah. then how big your job is. You know, it's funny. But they I, understand I, that reliability though is so important. Like if you shoot Bob Iger or Tim Cook, or, you know, or it's like, yeah. I, I've, I've seen it like in some of the bigger top CEOs, like you have seven minutes. Yep. By the time he walks in the door, you have seven minutes, so nothing can go down in that seven minutes. Like the time he literally or a CEO walks in, it's like, you got him? Yeah. All right, he's gone, and you're yeah. never getting him back again, he or she back. Yeah, so and if you screw that up, <laughs> you know, if you're the one who screws that up, your ass is in, you know, in, in the firing yeah. line, right? Yeah. And you don't want I technology to be that reason for that yeah. you know no you can't you can't have it be and, and it's funny i've been trying so going back to decision making process who's else involved right another way that i've been playing around with which helps out quite a bit is when you ask somebody like okay what why are you doing this what's the main reason da, 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 and then you go hey okay so who else, like if this didn't go well who else would be negatively impacted by this within the organization like who would pay attention right if it didn't go well if it goes well, everybody's happy and everybody's doing their thing. But if it didn't go well, who who does it impact the most, right? By asking that question, because you're just like, okay, I'm trying to understand like the the org chart here, basically, and saying who who really is impacted by this, and then they'll tell you, well, oh, well, my boss, you know, whoever it is, and then it's an easy parlay to, okay, well, so then does it make sense to bring them in on this conversation since they're the ones who are most negatively impacted by this if it doesn't go well? And then it's like, if they say no to that, it's like, okay, you're a, you're an idiot now. Like you just told me that these people probably who are above you are going to get sub significantly negatively in impacted by this, but yet you don't want to have them part of this? Like, uh doesn't make a lot of sense to me so it's a it's a small little shift that i've done recently that that kind of gets people it's almost like a no-brainer to have them be like oh yeah i i gotta get them involved here as opposed to i gotta be the one right yeah and with so much data too it shows the because a lot of uh in the corporate world it's the video marketing departments and and they could uh -huh. see how well that content did or did not do and yeah. changes need to be made and stuff like that so very how cool. do you 
How do people get measured? I mean, I, that's a tough. So this one is this is a tough industry because the output is the ultimate output, right? Like on this, like what I do, I can kind of carve it up in a bunch of different ways. Like the people that I work with, for instance, like VPs of sales, and you know, there's a dotted, obviously, a, a dotted line to revenue, a dotted line to conversion ratios, a dotted line to that. It's it's rarely a direct one to one, but you know, in your space, there is an output. Period. And that output is an extremely tangible output. And so I want to ask, like, marketing is a weird thing to me these days because there's so many different ways they show ROI or pretend to show ROI. Is it MQLs? Is it SQLs? Is it this? Is it that? Right. Um, What's the ultimate thing that they measure as an output for what you sell them? Mm, Good question. I'm trying to think when I last asked some of our clients um that's a good question because i'm trying to think of like they just uh they just i you know the deepest i've had conversations about this is mostly about you know how it's it's that overall vision message right and then how well it's penetrating um sometimes it's kind of secretive so they can't really tell me the metrics on what they're actually getting from it but um it's 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 to hit them in all different form there's so many platforms now too that's the other thing too so um but they got to make stuff or uh, sorry this might sound like a roundabout answer but you know content went from shooting horizontal to vertical Uh and so there's such a big shift in that that Uh it's like okay the audience wants it everything this way because the iphone is then there's your traditional content. So the the quantity has gone up to surface ads on Instagram, Facebook ads, totally separate from national broadcasts that they're also doing internally now, which is very surprising, not outsourcing it as much right. that I've seen too as well. Um, but it's just this constant need to be out there every day. Um, yeah. I think YouTube was a big... Uh, Advocate, not advocate, but uh, what happened is because YouTube creators had to publish every day, everyone expects something from you every day. Yeah. Like uh, you guys have content every day now, too. Every so, day. It's a pain in the ass. Every, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the metrics they say is like, we got to be out there every day. It's like, yep. it's, it's just like we got to make something. So that's, well, that's, that's the big deal. And that's the, see, that's what's interesting to me, right? Because it's funny once you get like if you sell on that vision if you sell on the alignment with what they're trying to accomplish roi needs to be there like this is just at least my my thought process here like yes now especially now more than ever in general like things are going to the cfo and they have to point to to impact and roi and those type of things but really when you get down to roi of whatever the investment is it's clients have a really hard time articulating what the baseline metric they're even looking for is. And so I I feel like a lot of the ROI conversations are very check the box. I'm asking you for the ROI as a vendor, like what is the ROI of this thing? But they rarely measure nuance, measure the true ROI. Like that's what for me, for instance, like when somebody says, well, John, what's the ROI of your training? I'm like, (laughs) okay, you want to get into this conversation? Like, great. All right. Uh, what are your current conversion ratios for your email campaigns to your tier one accounts with this specific persona? Like what's what's that conversion ratio? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, what are your cold call conversion ratios to this persona in this industry? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know. Okay. So then how are you going to ask me about ROI when you don't even have a baseline metric for it? So I think so many people are are a little bit too stuck in the, let me show you the ROI of this and that's what I'm going to sell to versus aligning with vision, aligning with value, aligning with direction. And okay, yeah, we'll check off some of those ROI boxes as we go down. Is that Was that a shift for you um, in your mentality of like kind of feature function ROI versus like, no, 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 let's, let's level up here? Yeah, absolutely. Because our previous and still existing customers were people in the motion picture industry uh, like, because it was such an expensive product, it was only rental houses. They uh-huh. would always come back to us and tell us, like, we're not making a return on our investment. And you're going to come out with a new product in three, I don't know how many years. Yep. So they're the ones always complaining. 
But I, I would say in the corporate space, I haven't got that because they're buying it, but they're not complaining it's not being rented or, or yeah. used enough. And they're, they are using it and stuff yeah. like that. So I haven't really, I apologize, I haven't really heard nope. the ROI from that side, but from the traditional yeah, client. Yeah, yep. they they talk all the time. And am I going to make my money back? Am I going to, you know, you yep. got technology change so fast. You know, you're going to come out with something next year, which we don't. And that's why people find us. Uh, people like us is that we have a roadmap. We don't come out with new product every six months. And and when we do come out with it, but we find a, le- a path of least resistance to transfer over to that next technology. Right. Um, we don't do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Here, you gotta buy the next new thing, <laughs> yeah, you know. Sorry, stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> but, so, and so, so, how is with that? Where do you see, like, from an innovation standpoint, right? Because I look at our, you know, the sales and the SaaS and the tech industry and stuff, you know, all the AI tools that are coming out right now, and things are moving so insanely fast that it is really hard to keep up with this stuff. But in the in the film industry, if you will, or the camera, like, I, I mean, there's only so much higher quality you can get, right? It's incremental. And I mean, I just look at the iPhone, right? Like the first version of the iPhone, the phone was okay. You know, the camera was okay. And the next version was, it was better, you know? And, but now, yeah. you know, with the portrait mode and stuff like that, it's like, how much better can this sucker get? Okay. Maybe I can zoom further and get clarity, that type of thing. So how is, or is innovation impacting your industry as as what for what you sell not forget about like what's happening socially and all the that that type of stuff but where are you seeing the biggest impact that innovation is having in your in your space yeah it's it's very interesting and and that's where the feedback you know it's funny you think you can't go any farther but the creative people is that really push us um and that's what i i love my industry is because we make high precision product for a creative person yeah. So it's really funny sometimes you're like, this is the cleanest, sharpest lens you make. And the yeah, but I don't want that. I want right. like aberrations or other, you know, so it's kind of, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's very wild that it's like, wow, we just made something. And then sometimes they go, oh yeah, but I, I'm a creative person. Like, right. so the, it, the drive is actually comes from that. It's like, yeah, you, you got, you went 17 stops at dynamic range, but I really want 20. It's like, okay. So it's like, so they're the ones that are actually pushing us the most and stuff. And and even in the TED stack tool, what's really crazy is I had my first request last year to have a meeting in the metaverse. Oh God, so they really? Wanted to have, <laughs> they wanted to have a demo in the metaverse. I hope I'm out of business, man. If we're if we're meeting in the in the metaverse, I I hope I'm on a beach somewhere in Hawaii and I'm not doing I'm not have to work anymore because I, I actually started a long time ago. Um, and it was, it was so weird. I, I, I guess if it does come to the point where you can put glasses on and it's like an augmented reality and we can do that. So it's kind of cool. But if I have to sit there and look at you as a cartoon and you know what I mean? Like what the metaverse is right now, I, I want nothing to do with that. Yeah. Well, that, that was one ROI. I reached out to an animation studio, see how much it would cost to do this. And, and it just said, it, it's too expensive. It's not just like, hi, just meet you there. No, they want to put the camera on their shoulder play with it do like all you know it's not just like walk around the car and just right. oh, oh that's cool the metaverse yeah. no no i want to play with it do you know yeah. so you know it's, it, it'll get there you know um you know and but, but the, i think that's the biggest thing for us is we have to be so open-minded yeah um i remember like 10 years ago a filmmaker because he publishes videos every day said i want to shoot straight to the cloud i don't want to record in a camera i want to land in my computer i edit it i publish it and at that time, it was science fiction, you know, yep. science fiction. But a company made that today and sold it to Adobe for a one point three uh, billion dollars. Yeah. So it's it's just you have to be very open minded. I think that's the biggest challenge. Are your customers being impacted by the AI generation of? I mean, because right now, I, you know, it's funny things are. I, I mean, they're moving at a mind numbing speed right now. Like chat GPT came out and I was like, holy shit, this is yeah. insane. And I started diving into it. And I'm like, I got to learn this because it's, 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 this is it. Right. But then just recently I start paying attention to like, uh, auto GPT, right. Where you can literally, it ties together four or five different things. And I can literally say to it, 
um, make me a movie, uh, you know, about Jason Bourne and, but make it in Sesame street. And I want big, I, I want big bird to be Jason Bourne. And I want you to do it in a virtual world where they're in space doing this. And you know, the outcome is blah and, It'll do it for you. So it'll render the images. It'll make the movie. It'll. So where, like, are these conversations coming up in your conversations? And how are you staying on top of that component of the trend? Because there's the video production recording of this thing. But my fear right now where we're going with AI is that creators, it's, it's, it's a different level of creativity, right? Because the original creator that created the original Jason Bourne movie the original movie track or, you know, audio, what AI is doing is it's learning off of that, right? And it's creating this whole new thing, but it's doing it at such a rate that it's going to, you know, copywriters are now like out of business, you know, coders are kind of out of business. Where do you see the biggest impact that these type of tools are going to have in your space? And, and how do you think the industry is going to evolve to it? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting time. I mean, there's a, big conference uh, called HPA in our industry where people show new technology and they did show a script that was written, I think, with chat GPT 3.0 and yep. stuff and it was pretty good. So, um, you know, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a conversation piece, you know. And, uh, but I, I think like when, I, when at least we saw scripts and stuff, man, there's still a level of creativity uh, that wasn't there. It sounded formulaic but yeah. you know i know it's going to keep learning i get it yeah. stuff too but yeah it's definitely opened up a bunch of conversations on you know what that means for us creatively wise well and i guess like for you right so i'm trying to tell some some of my friends in, in other industries that don't pay attention to this like all these tech all this new tech and i'm like you know for instance i got a bunch of lawyer friends I go and or financial financial advisors, right? Where they pick stocks and that type of stuff. And I'm looking at them going, guys, uh, it's I can already talk into uh, you know Auto GPT and say, hey, here's my risk profile. Go find me accounts. I got a thousand dollars. Go invest in the most internet, and and it'll do what I want them to do, and it'll actually do it better than you, and it'll do it 24 seven. Lawyers, same thing. You're like as long as there's a lawyer. Um, as long as uh, you have to go to trial and there's a, a, a judge and a jury of people, then the main lawyer is going to absolutely be necessary, right? But all those paralegals that run around looking for a case precedent and all that other stuff, like they're unnecessary at this point. I look at your industry and I say, and I even go back, this is where I'll be about four or five years ago. Remember the movie Evita that was kind of half <laughs> CGI? It was mostly CGI and a yeah. couple of humans, right? I mean, that shit yeah. was, and this was like four or five years ago where- like the the main woman, the main woman character who was CGI, right, looked really fucking close to a human. Now you can tell, right? So let's talk about cameras, right? If I can now render a human almost perfectly and it looks like a human and it's, you know, it's a little bit off, right? Where does that leave your, like literally your physical space of recording Right? Do you think it's going to continue because there's always going to be a need for original content that is that is you know for a human, or do you think eventually it's going to be like I don't need cameras anymore because I can just do this all in high def on my computer and do edits that way without after because I can pull different recordings that are already out there of all these different people. Are you see it moving in that direction? Um, I mean, there, I I feel so blessed to have such amazing product managers in German German company. Yep. that are very open-minded they're listening um because you know things are changing so <laughs> if it's new products and we are always developing new products is, is a big thing one of the big things in our industry is mixed reality which is the yep. actual actor against the uh, led wall you know which blew up with mandalorian that was a big show that kind of really blew yeah. it up but or 300 building think, what, 300 was the wasn't 300 the first movie that was all uh all all green screen basically yeah, green screen yeah absolutely yep. and stuff yep. and uh and yeah and and if things change i i i feel very confident we're able to adapt because they listen and they're they're yep. they're not you know just like we make this so you have to do it this way <laughs> um we're always looking for feedback and you know if it's if our company transitions over maybe it is someday more software driven yep. 
uh, company too. It's it's just changing, you know. That was the one thing. I don't know if I can share a Xerox story, but what scared me when I was at Xerox was my manager at the time told me, this is why we're, you know, the best. I go, okay, well, you know, tell me we're, we're, we're the best because this is the only thing we make. Yeah. And at the time, this was when Kodak was kind of an interesting challenge. You know, they're like, you know, went down like, oh, 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 that's it. I, you know, there was so, there was more than a few red flags at Xerox when I was there. Like I, I was just like, okay, wait a minute. Like you can't lean on, and you know, there's there's example. I mean, in your space, Polaroid, right? I mean, think yeah. about Polaroid for a minute. Yeah. Like they were, holy shit! Like they in they innovated, but then they just sat on that innovation, and they're like, yep, we did it, and this is what it's going to be now. And now they're or Kodak, right? Same thing. It's like no, this yeah. digital shit. Like nobody's going to buy into that. People want film. It's like, uh, you fucking evolve here, man. Right. And, and I think it's good to hear that, yeah. uh, that you guys are evolving along the way. Yeah. And then I think that's why, like, I always, I, I also know technology in our industry changed so fast. So even learning how the SaaS industry works and in, in, in sales and the tech stack tools that people use, you know, always helps me to stay on top of things too, yeah. as well, and uh, apply it to our business as well. So. Um, where we've implemented the same tools that you talked about um, yep. as well. And it's been very beneficial. So it doesn't have to be just SaaS. It works in yep. hardware sales, yep. just the same too, you know? So, That's what I try to get people. Like every time I talk to somebody like a client, well, we're different. I'm like, ah, okay, I, I, yes, all right, you're different. Like fundamentally, yes, there's a, <laughs> there, you, you're not the same exact thing as somebody else, but we all have to find clients to talk to. We all have to do our research. We all have to have good conversations. We all have to uncover pain. We all have to align with values, like it, regardless of what the industry is. And so sales techniques to me are sales techniques, right? And and the the profession of sales is is relatively universal, which is why, you know, I wanted to have this conversation with you because I think a lot of people just kind of assume that all like tech sales is different and, you know, I'm more traditional. It's like, if you're not adapting, if you're not evolving, if you're not looking adjacent industries or whatever it is to see what they're doing, you're going to get stuck in your echo chamber. And eventually that echo chamber is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you're not going to, you're not going to be able to get out of it. And so I, I love yeah. your approach of, because I, because I mean, quite frankly, you did get a lot of, not a lot, but probably you did told me you got some pushback from like going into corporate being like, that's not our thing. Right. So, and you had to fight that battle internally to say, no, 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 it's worth it. It's going to take a while, but it's worth it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and what I also was trying to educate too, is like virtual, like I was able to sell without even, cause there's the old mindset. They have to touch it, yeah. feel it, put on the shoulder. And, you know, I have to find them. There's a film filmmaker from Nebraska and Baton Rouge that say, we're not coming to your big trade show next year. Can we do a virtual? And this was in 19, uh, 2019 before the pandemic happened. Yeah. And they were already going, hey, can you do a virtual demo? And I was like, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> you know, you have to adapt, right? So I was like, sure, yeah. absolutely. So I did it all virtual. And I, I have to think of buying them because when the pandemic happened, I knew what to do. Like nice. I just grabbed the gear, built a studio at home, and I was doing everything virtual and Love stuff. It. And that was that was a big head start for me because I was yeah. like, I knew what to do and, and was able to close without them ever touching it you know that's it huge. didn't have to touch the product that was a that was a big big I, lesson I, mean, I was gonna say that's gonna be a paradigm shift for what you're you're used to right it's like it's kind of yeah. the, the same thing where you, you if you watch the evolution of SaaS, you know i think when it first came out people like when when the cloud first came out everybody was like oh you know i remember my parents like oh my god no way i'm not putting my credit card online you gotta be you know you gotta be crazy right and then all of a sudden it was like, all right, you know, I'll buy something for 10 bucks, 20 bucks online, that type of things. Cause there's security and you know that, all right, cool. And then it went up to a hundred bucks, a few hundred bucks and, and businesses, you know, there was, I, there was vivid, I vividly remember Salesforce signed a, I think $150 million contract, um, with, I think it was state farm or something like that. And mm -hmm. it was the first, because before that, it was like, well, okay, yeah, the cloud is cute. And if you want to drop thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on the cloud, you can do it. But if you really want a real ERP solution or a real whatever solution, 
that's on-prem. You got to have this conversation. And Salesforce blew that out of the water with this $150 million contract. And then everybody was like, holy shit, the cloud is real. And now let's adapt this. So there's there's this evolution of like, yeah, no, but the people that keep trying new things and 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 being open to your point, being open to, all right, okay, let me try this out. Like, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but you're asking me. And sometimes the, it's, it's the customer that's forcing you to do it versus you coming to them and saying, okay, this is how I'm going to do it which is to me the best way because you're listening and you're adapting to what the client's looking for. So I, I really commend you on kind of being uh, being in such a traditional hardware-driven feature function space and 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 kind of opening up your eyes to new opportunities and evolving because it's, it's, it, it's, it's a trait that I think more than a few people need to adapt to right now. Because if they're stuck in their ways of like, nope, this is how I've done it, they're, I, I am deathly afraid of what's going to happen to them. Yeah. No, I, and I appreciate what you taught me too, because I like, I would never have heard of like Bidyard or anything too. That tool is, you know, what's funny, I, I wish I did it here, but I, I actually set up my camera as my web camera when I do my virtual. And it's a great uh, icebreaker because we're in the middle of conference and then they stop and wait, 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 wait. And is that your product you're using as a web camera and it's a great icebreaker so, oh, yeah. so you have a hundred thousand dollar web camera <laughs> a web camera and they're just like and i go yes it is so uh, you know because i leave all the data up around the edges yep. so they can yep. tell like oh wait a minute wait wait wait, wait hold on and it's a great icebreaker Love it. but you know actually using our own product yeah it the video video too has Love been it. very uh icebreaker but yeah it's been it's been you know a wealth of great knowledge. I appreciate it, John, because it's and and it keeps growing too, you know. And it's yeah. um and now we're onboarding our more of our team, which is yeah. awesome. They're very excited I about them all it. In the, and, the other day, by the way, I was psyched when I saw everybody yeah, with the right. RMA. Yeah, because they're they're so used to like. I remember we had a meeting and they're like, "Man, you didn't you didn't talk about the product to the customer at all and stuff." Like, right. And just like you taught me, it's like, well, we're not even there yet. We're trying to figure out what, figure out what, if what it is or, thing. yeah right and they're just because they're my you know it's just you know just how tech is like, like yeah, yeah. But just get you out jump in we don't even know why, why yeah. are you asking like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, what that is it's, it's still no matter how much you, we hear about it as far as like solution selling or listening to the client or you know all that stuff it still amazes me how the vast majority of sales professionals still ask very basic qualification questions and then hard shift to their pitch and don't engage at all. And it's like, here's my pitch and you either like it or you don't. And these days customers are liking it less and less. So yeah. I would yeah. say that one, one, one tech thing that works for us, and I know it's challenging for um, some other industries, but we're able to text message, which is very interesting is because a lot of people are on set and, yep. and we can communicate and say, hey, you know, I know you're on set right now. Just want to send you a little. And, and we're able to actually include that in our cadence is text messaging, which I know in a lot of industries, it's like major taboo on the first touch, but um, it actually works for us. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, it, well, you're, you're spot on because of because of the personas you go after, right? It's it's the same thing with people who go after people who are on the manufacturing floor. Like if you're going after people who are on the manufacturing floor, they don't have hard lines. They don't. They barely check their emails, but they're on their phones the entire time. So I think if you understand your audience and how they like to be communicated with, it's totally you know. And and I've started playing around with text a little bit on cold like i love it when you and i have a conversation right and then i say hey what's up jason you know my you mind if i you know text you you know can i get yourself on that type of thing that that's easy but from a cold standpoint i'm using it very similar to the way i'm using phone these days which is when i leave a voicemail it's not because i, I expect you to call me back it's because i'm t i'm telling you i did something else i'm like hey you know i just sent you this email i just sent you this video if you could take a look at it let me know so it's that other touch and it's the same thing with text now I'll send you that video, I'll send you that email, and then I'll text you and say, hey, Jason, I'm sorry to bother you. I know this is your cell phone. I just want to give you a heads up. I sent you a, uh, a, an email with a quick little video. If you could take a look at it, I won't bother you again. But if you could take a look at that, let me know. I'd appreciate it. And that's it. I'm not asking you to text me back. I'm not pitching you on my text. I'm using it as a touch to tell you to go back and look at something else, and we're increasing the conversion ratios because of that. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. Man. Awesome, Will. Let's uh, let's wrap this up because uh, you know we're kind of yeah. coming up on the forty five minute range here, which is a good uh, a good little uh, yeah for the, for the audience. Where um, 
what do you want to leave the audience with? And, and, you know, feel free to obviously tell them about, um, anything, if you want them to follow you or take a look at some of your, co- like what you're doing out there, as far as the products that Ari is putting out there. But, um, what do you want to leave the audience with here? Yeah. Um, I'm always open to talk to new people cause I'm always learning, always open-minded. So they could, uh, find me on LinkedIn if they like to, um, cool. if they're interested to learn more about the industry, they can, I use this app email address called bizdev at airy.com. They can reach me there if they're interested. And cool. um, yeah, I love to have more conversations because I'm always learning and always trying to keep an open mind. That's the biggest there you thing. Go. You know? Love it. And it's yeah, things are happening so fast. Is it A R it's A R R I dot com, right? Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, it's at airy A R R I dot com. Yeah. Perfect. It's two R's. And, yeah. Perfect. And for those of you listening, it's Jason and it's uh what, how do you pronounce your last name again? Oh, we say in a way like in a way I like vodka, and in a way I like scotch. <laughs> Love it. That's what I say. <laughs> so in a way, it's I N O U Y E. It'll be in the show notes, and I'll put your LinkedIn profile in there. Jason, thank you so much for coming on, man, and thank you also for being. Thanks for having me. Yeah, but you know, I really genuinely appreciate your your how you take advantage of the content that I put out there because nothing's more frustrating than. Putting, like the reason I got into this space was because when I took this training, it had such a positive impact on me, and and I and I thought it was so good that I wanted to get it out there to as many other people as possible. So it's frustrating to me when I'm like, no, here's my cell phone, call me, email me, like like take this content, the shit works, and people don't, right? Or they just kind of go through the motions, and you're one of those that does not go through the motions. You genuinely take advantage. I mean, you're on every AMA that we do. You show up to the sessions, even though you've seen the session, like half the sessions before you still no, come back to them and everything else. So I really do really appreciate you uh, you getting engaged here. And I'd I love to see the progression of how you've been able to break out of the mold and and kind of change the game a lot with with what you're doing here. So thank you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it too. I always think, man, you, more people need to come to your AMAs, man, because it's you give a wealth <laughs> of knowledge. So. <laughs> I try, man. I appreciate it. I learned just like you. I learned just, uh, you know, from everybody else coming on board and sharing their perspective too. So awesome. Well, let's wrap this up and look, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did here. And, um, you know, if you're one of those people out there just trying to, you know, either going through the motions or thinking that your industry is in some trouble here, just adapt, you know, start trying new shit and, and, and realize that, you know, you might be getting told that, oh, we don't do it that way here. But, you know, if you keep hearing that, you might want to either find a different place or try something else because that's only going to lead to uh, less and less results. Let's put it that way. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right, everybody. Look, um, like I say at all the end of all these podcasts here, go out there and make somebody smile today because no matter how bad your day is going or how bad you think it went, if you go out there and make somebody smile today, you know you had a good day and the world needs a lot more of that right now. So thank you all very much for listening and I will see you on the other side. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. With your support and our incredible guests, we're one of the top sales podcasts out there right now, and I can't thank you enough. Now, to keep the momentum going, it would mean the world to me if you could go and leave a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform and share some of your favorite episodes with your network. Also, check out my new website at www.johnmmichaelbarrows.com, where you'll find even more ways to engage. There's a ton of free content, and you can also get trained from me directly as an individual or for your team. Look, I'm out there selling every day just like you are, and I'm doing my best to stay on top of all the latest trends in technology. So if you're looking to level up and you give a shit about this profession of sales, let's connect and let's make this happen together. 